and we're calling it Piling On. And the reason why I've called this Piling On, it just feels like one of those tragic stories where you hear this horrible stuff and you go, oh, there's more? Oh, well, that's really, oh, there's more? And you go, that's really, bi- there's more? It's that kind of story that continues in this thing. It's like one of the stories that, I mean, so many stories we've heard after the hurricane, and we still hear some of them after Ian, some of the tragedies and the pain after the storm, whether it's insurance companies are still not your home or living in a trailer still uh, waiting for uh, it to be reclaimed. Just, just had a friend in, in North Fort Myers who just had to prove again pictures just last month that there was water intrusion. Had to have pictures all over again to go, yeah, yeah, this really did happen. And the insurance goes, okay, I guess that did come through your house. Yes. And so some of that stuff feels like piling on. You know, you have this stuff that goes on in your life and you go, how can it be any worse? Oh, wait, just wait a few days. It can. And it's so hard to to look at some of these stories and realize that we can recognize some of these things in our lives. Um, yeah, I don't want to go on about other stuff because then it will see, seem like I'm piling on on other things. But this is a true story. I thought this was very interesting. Every once in a while, I get the Florida Weekly. It's one of those free papers, and it has kind of just unique stories in it called News of the Weird. And typically, they're, they're real stories. And they're so bizarre that they go, this is so bizarre. It's real. Well, I picked one up. It seemed to really fit on this particular Sunday, January 19th. Uh, just this past year, in the beginning of the year, in Austin, Texas, Chris Newby was sleeping when the whole house shook. He said, it sounds like, sounds like an, a plane hit the house. Instead, according to KXAN-TV, it was a car. It was an impaired driver who barreled through Newby's spare bedroom wall. The entire room was just crunched and collapsed. Ten days later, Newby received a letter from the city informing that he was in violation of two codes. One for having a hole in your house. That's a violation, by the way. You're not allowed to have a hole in your house. And one for having no window where there should have been a window. Newby said the letter was dated the day of the crash and stipulated that he had 30 days to get the repairs completed or face fines of up to $4,000 per day. He said, and I quote, it felt tone deaf to me. He said, I'm in violation for being a victim. Newby said... Um, feels less like home every day. You know, this idea of piling on, some of you guys know what some of those things are, and some of us are oversensitive, so you actually have more of those stories, but some of us can really understand what it means to go, man, just one more thing, just one more thing, just one more thing. So then we come to our story in Job, where God allows Satan to have his way, minus the protection of God on the man himself. We are in still the first chapter. It's because I guess we're covering it so thoroughly. Or whoever's doing this stuff is just super slow. Which either case, we're going to start in verse 13 of chapter 1. Of course, this was after the meeting and (laughs) after the slap, if you will. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Verse 16, while he was still speaking. I mean, you got to catch this. While he was still talking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. It's interesting that they just, uh, you know, there's allowed at least one person who survives so they can be a messenger of this bad news. And I think what's interesting here, and I think it's a reminder, and I know I've said this several times in these last three weeks, Job does not have the luxury of this meeting in heaven. He just doesn't have that. We get a little sneak peek of God meeting with the angels and Satan and kind of having this backstory of all this stuff. Again, it reminds us of our own situation where we go, we have no idea what's going on in the heavenlies. We know that there's a warfare, but our job is to continue to trust and to have faith that God is in charge and that he's sovereign. So when a messenger comes and just says this, so it's without the backdrop of this meeting. 
the fire of God fell from the sky. When you just hear that, and you don't have this understanding, you have to do something with that. And why do they always call these things acts of God? As if God were sitting here just, just, just trying to mess with us. It is an amazing thing. So the issue is, no matter whether the insurance calls it an act of God, or it just happens, or it's just a high-pressure cell, whatever it is, the deal is, we know better, and we know God's in control. And this is the difference between having faith and trusting God and knowing he's sovereign when everything else doesn't make sense. And Job doesn't have that particular information. You know what he really has? He has an understanding of who God is. And that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, verse 17, I'll go on. While he was still speaking, this is an, uh, another one, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Man. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. These are an amazing stack of verses here. There are a lot of different events that are happening here, one literally after another. It's a series of events that when it gets reported one after another, while the person is finishing, still speaking. In other words, this is a matter of just they're, they're all connected because it's just like one continuous conversation, it seems like. And while another was speaking, and while another was speaking, and finally the loss and the death of all of ten, ch ten children of Job's. Now, what we get to see here is the nastiness, the evil nature, the horrific hate, hatred of Satan, the vileness of him, the evil of evil of him. He is our adversary. He is cruel. He is our enemy. He is an accuser. This is all out of Bible. He is a liar. He is a thief. And he is an enemy of God. And if we're going to be for God, he's an enemy of us. And we see on one hand the, the version of evil, the, the Sebians, uh, the fire from heaven, a great wind, the Chaldeans. And we can look sideways. By the way, we do this all the time. It's the government. Oh, it's the taxes. Oh, it's this. Oh, it was my neighbor's fault. And we can always see something else to be able to go, oh, we have plenty of people to blame in our lives for all the stuff that goes on. But to Job directly, none of this seems to happen to him. It happens to everything that is connected to Job. Death to his sheep, his servants, his camels, and death to all his sons and daughters. First of all, I just want to make this point that there is only the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And I, I know that most of us know this in this room. Most of us understand that there are two kingdoms. But we need to be reminded that all this ancillary stuff, whether it's the Chaldeans or a great wind or fire from the sky or whatever, we go, oh, look over there, look over here, look over here, that we understand there's two kingdoms. And I think that reminder is always very helpful. Matthew 12, 30 said, Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me, and who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus said that you're either with him or you're against him. There's no middle ground. There's no, uh, I'm kind of a Christian. I'm kind of spiritual. Uh, I'm kind of worldly. I'm kind of, it's either being a Jesus follower or not. There is no in between. You're either with Jesus or you're with Satan. We all love the declaration of Joshua when he meets up with the, uh, the Israelite leaders in Shechem. It's a beautiful verse. I mean, I think we still have the, picture with a nice frame with those words, with this particular verse on it. Joshua says to the people in 14 through 15 in chapter 24, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors, worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I mean, even Bob Dylan gets this, okay? It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You understand. I mean, he could do it really well. 
That's a long song. He keeps repeating that line, too, over and over again. It's so easy to pick on those who are worse than us when it comes to evil and Satan's influence. And we can look at the Taliban, we can look at ISIS, we can look at Putin, we can look at Xi, we can look at Zhang Un, or any dictator of the month you want to look at to go, oh, there's all kinds of problems in our world. You can look to wokeness, you can look to Hollywood, you can look at child molesters. And the real issue, if you're not following Jesus, you're with them. Just clear and simple. So when we talk about these guys, you're either with Jesus or you're not. And somehow we create this kind of third category who's not like us and not like normal other people of the world. They're the really bad people. Revelation 3.16 out of the New King James Version says, So then, because you are neither lukewarm or neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And so when we look at this reality that you're either with Jesus or you're not, because there is no back and forth. There is no in-between. And we all know what it looks like to be a lukewarm fence setter and then to see what Jesus thinks here in Revelation 3. The only reason Satan is allowed to do and manipulate and use not only fallen people, he uses fallen people, but situations in Job's life to divert his allegiance away from God. So this is about sides. You're either with God or, or with Satan. You're either with me or against me, Jesus said. If your attention, your focus, your time, your energy, your money, your heart is not trusting and focusing on Jesus, then it appears to be other sideish. I mean, do you see how many diversions and misdirections and distractions there are in life? For real. Every single day. I mean, you just mentioned it, bro. You just, the idea of there's always something to be able to go, yeah, I'm doing really fine. Oh, yeah. It just, just to be able to be sidetracked. And divert it. It doesn't take, but you know what? You turn, on, you turn the, uh, the kitchen sink and that thing goes and just fire hydrants you right there. It's a diversion. It's just not, and, and I got I to gotta walk out of the house right now because all I was doing was just getting a drink of water. But boy, diversions happen all the time. Just getting sidetracked. Things happen every day. And this is what the story of Job is telling us. The, I think the story of Job is a gift. It is a gift to us. It's either God or not. And every time I have an opportunity, you can go with me on this one if you get the drift. Every time I have an opportunity to complain, whine, get angry, be selfish, be annoyed, get offended, argue, or divide, I am at a crossroads of faith every single time. And you know what? It seems like some days it happens multiple times a day. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Choose this drive home at this particular time who you're going to serve. Choose this accusation who you're going to serve. Choose this shift at work. Choose this conflict that you're in continually. Choose this accusation or this loss. Choose this brokenness, this illness, this temptation, this news report. Choose this day who you will serve. This social media post, choose this day who you will serve. You fill it in. Fill in the blank. Choose this day. Whatever the situation is, who are you going to serve today? The issue of God allowing suffering continues to stir questions among the, the great why questions, quite honestly. We all think that there has to be a some degree of suffering in each one of us that we've experienced sometime in our life. But if you've been around people in, in my life in ministry, I've seen suffering beyond description. I think sometimes when you, when you serve and you're looking at other people, it is much easier to see the difference on how sometimes you have it pretty good. When you're pouring out to somebody else, those of you that serve get this. I mean, on a constant, regular basis, where you get your eyes off yourself. I love what Rich Mullins said many, 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 many years ago when he was alive. When asked about, it was during the great uh, self-esteem movement for teenagers. So we need to build their self-esteem. He goes, well, I got word for you. And it was to 800 teenagers at a conference I was at. If you're going to help build your self-esteem, the first thing you need to do is get off of yourself. It was just so clear. It was like, that is so true. 
get off of yourself so that you can actually be looking at other people. And it's an amazing thing what happens to your self-esteem when you're able to look and to serve other people. And I, I think there's so many horrific stories, and some of you guys have probably been through some of them. And I heard this before, and I th- the only theological reference I have is this heavenly meeting. So it's not a great proof text to be able to say what I'm going to say, but it's a very interesting thought anyway. We talked about this two weeks ago in the beginning of Job. But could believers who are really being challenged, could God possibly say? Now there's one I have confidence in. I mean, I'm not saying he does that. We, don't have, we just have this particular text in Job. But there's stuff going on in the heavenlies all the time, and I'm thinking, there is someone I could trust this suffering to produce fruit and a testimony for others. I mean, we talked about it with uh, Stephen this morning in Sunday school. And the idea of, you hear Peter's preaching this message on the day of Pentecost. Stephen goes twice as long in his message and later in Acts, and they're ready to stone him. And he's a young fellow. And Peter gets to lead later, and you're going, where's the justice? Why is this fair? It's not fair. But Stephen would usher in this dispersion of the church that would spread all over the globe. And because of that, the gospel went everywhere. And then we'd say, thank you, Stephen. And you'd go, no, thank you, God, for being so gracious and so good, for allowing that to happen for a greater purpose of what would ultimately be be the building of his church. Now, we've seen it with Job. We've seen it with Joseph. We went through Joseph. We've seen it with David, with Peter and Paul, and with Jesus and so many others who've had honor and privilege that we read about, who have all kinds of different things, suffering that happens to them, where you go, oh, wait, we got the end of the story on this one. We get to see something that's really amazing through their story. And living in this world, we are constantly bombarded for allegiance to be taken off of God and away from God. Besides suffering... There's three areas, and I know that we're kind of diverting off of the Job story here by going to these three areas, but it's just a reminder of his dominion. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, we are not unaware of his schemes. And I think these are lessons again and reminders again. More than anything else, they're reminders about what tools Satan uses. One of them is division. He is a divider, he is a destroyer of unity, and a master at strife. The opposite, I mean, just look at any marriage. You get into stuff that you just is, is feeling like it's divorce producing, and you're going, man, this is just too hard. This conflict, this disunity, this is Satan's territory. We're not unaware of his schemes, that all believers are one. And you look at sometimes how the church has acted against itself, and we become our own worst enemies on how we divide over different things. We are on the same side under the banner of Jesus. Satan comes against, unity, comes against unity. And that is why it's important to recognize disunity and destroy it and fight for unity as much as we possibly can. Unity doesn't mean that we all agree on the same thing. I've said it hundreds of times before. You'd never get married if it, you'd agreed on every single thing. I know it's especially true for you. You would not be able to be married. We have to agree on every single point of every single thought. And like, it's not realistic. But can we have unity with disagreement? Because we actually have unity on really much bigger things that we can actually love one another and be a team. Division happens in the churches. It happens in marriage. It happens in family and in relationships and even among friends. Mark 3, 24 through 25 says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. Titus 3.10, as for the person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. I think that there are tools that we have in regards with fighting disunity and what it means to go, no, this is, you will not come against us, Satan, to break us up. We need to come together. Division is one of those tactics Satan used. Understand when we look at divisions, many times we're looking horizontally again, looking at the enemy horizontally. Because there's disagreements, 
I mean, I think one of the things that we've not learned how to do very well and continue to learn, learn worse, that's not the right language, to continue to unlearn and not do things right is on how to actually dialogue anymore. We've lost this art to be able to listen and ask questions as opposed to two sides who just want to be right and bang a table and who want to carry a sign and yell at one another because there's no conversation. But to be able to ask questions and understand and still be able to, because we are called to, love one another. You can't love one another when you are angry and hateful against the another side. Another one is we talked about just earlier is diversions. Satan uses the practice of, uh, practice of diverting our attention off of God and onto anything. 1 John 2, 16, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Uh, just looking over these three things really quickly. The lust of the flesh, there's a sensual pleasure, both legitimate and illegitimate, whether it's food, things, physical relationships, or even power. Our lust can be very strong and very distracting. They can get in the way of following Jesus. The second one is the lust of the eyes. It's this bottomless desire to have more of whatever you want, and you fill in the blank. More money, more sex, more power, more toys, more, bigger, better, stronger, faster, higher, lower, whatever. I mean, just look at the Morgan Morgan commercial. More, 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 for further reference. Anyway, third, the pride of life. The satisfaction is derived from processing and controlling things to the desire. Boy, you know what? When you really know you have control issues is when you have it gone from you, right? You didn't know you really had some control issues until the control thing was gone. I'm like, man, I really like to control that thing, and I had thought I had control over it, and I don't have control over it, but I really want control over that thing, and it's really bothering me, but I didn't have control over it before. You understand what I'm talking about, right? The deal is... When we just want to control, even the desire that other people operate and behave like we would like them to. The third one is the piling on of discouragement. Just briefly, many times the reason it feels like a pile-on is because it is. Now, that sounded really logical. But let me also say another part of this is many times it's because it's unreleased, unresolved, pride hanging on to stuff from our past that it feels like piling on because we've never resolved pieces in our life that we've kept hanging on to. That is something that we can, can, sur can surrender and let go because we have this idea of all these things that happened to me in my life and all of a sudden you're talking decades of things that have happened in my life. Things that have never been fixed, resolved, confessed, and dealt with. And you know what? When they, when they feel like they're that fresh that you can talk about them, they're not, they're not done yet. They're not done. Just talked to somebody last week who came up with about three or four different things that just went bang, 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 all in the past year or two. And I just remember saying to this person, I said, you're not healed yet. You still got a whole lot of stuff that you're just hanging on to. And it's not... By the way, we don't have this desire mentally to be go, no, 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 I need to hang on to it. We don't do that. We do it without thinking. We do it with, without thought that we're hanging on to this, that, that all of a sudden, why isn't this gone? Why is this still sticking to me? Why is it still so much part of my speech, and why is it part of my heart? It's because it's not truly been given to God. It's an amazing thing to be able to talk about it with such emotion, such angst, and such anger, and go, no, 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 no. I've already given that to God. And going, doesn't sound like it. Because we say words, God, God you got to take this, and still talk about it with the same anger. Anyway, that was supposed to be short, but piling on of the discouragement. Number two, understanding the challenge of blessing versus curses. I think this is kind of fun. Judgments based upon our own standard, our own scale, are made in every area of our life almost all the time. And I know that we're not called to judge, but we, we make judgments all the time. We woke somebody coming in the door, psh, we've got them nailed, we know what they are. They, we just do this. It's just an automatic fallen nature thing that we do with people. Oh, that's probably because they didn't plan well. Oh, they, oh, they forgot that. Oh, yeah, they're very forgetful. You know, we'll just put these storylines together because we are such great judges. 
We'd say, oh, this is nice. This was good. This service was horrible. The traffic was bad. The worship was dragging today. The weather is awful. God is blessing me with a raise. Oh, the devil's really involved with my manager's meeting today because it didn't go like I thought it would go. My boss did not respond well. Devil must be involved in here. So we put these values and these judgments all the time on different things, whether it goes well with this or doesn't, right? We, we look at this thing and go, man, God's really been good today. We're going to get into what job. Job. I almost said his name. <laughs> what Job says in regards with how things go and whether God gets praise or not, no matter what happens. We're going to see that. But we put values and judgments all the time based upon outcomes. And many times as Christians, I believe that we falsely spiritualize them as either godly or evil. Ecclesiastes 9, 1 through 2. Solomon writes this, This too I carefully explored, even... Though the actions of godly and wise people are in God's hand, no one knows whether God will show them favor. The same destiny ultimately awaits everyone, whether the righteous or wicked, good or bad, ceremonial or clean or unclean, religious or irreligious, good people. This is out of the New Living Translation, by the way. Good people receive the same treatment as sinners, and people who make promises to God are treated like people who don't. Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He, the Father causes his son, that's the, uh, the burning star one, his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Bad things happen to righteous people. Good things happen to wicked people and vice versa. The world's lostness and brokenness, brokenness is universal. And Jesus even gave us this promise, which we should have also framed in our living room wall. In this world, you will have trouble. And just go, yep, that's what it is. That's in my living room wall. In this world, you're going to have trouble. Jesus. And he just has it signed there. You go, that's, that's real life right there. And I don't think you need to be a Job to understand that. That when Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Have this one underlined. Each day has enough trouble of its own. For crying out loud, that's Jesus' words right there. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Like I said, I don't think you need to be a Job to understand that last sentence, but we can look to the story of Job on how to actually walk through that well, dependent upon God, and have a peace that passes all understanding. Now you strip down all of Job's valuables, his animals, his servants, and his children as a loss. And the question then becomes, and this is so crucial for us in our walk, is God still good? It's a great question. Is God still blessing me? Because when we, we look at this, we look at enemy territory. But what is our first response? If it's like Job, God is good and he's still a blessing. If God is only, this is so crucial for us to get. If God is only blessing, when we see it or it's going well for us, what kind of God do we serve? But when things go south or they don't go like they would like them, can we truly say that God still is a blessing and he is still good? Now, now we get into the meat of this. Job's response of worship. I like what the Bible says here. This is good stuff. This is excellent stuff. This stuff I have to go back to. Starting at verse 20, we're going to go to 22. At this, Job got up. This is after... And while he was still speaking, and while he was still speaking, and while he was still speaking. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. That makes a great poster for your wall. All this stuff that just happened to Job. Immediately at this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. You may not want to do all that. But anyway, he fell to the ground in worship. He fell to the ground. And all those other things, the tearing of the clothes, the shaving of the head, were all acts of, of sorrow and also of worship. I think we marvel at these words that come out of Job's mouth. 
And I think secretly, quietly, but deeply we would say, I want to respond like that all the time. You know, I want to respond in worship all the time, no matter what the situation is. That it's not just worship and thanksgiving when things are just sweet and honey and beautiful and great. But then when life is tragic, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is good and he is holy and he is righteous and he is in charge. And I think the reason why we marvel at this is because it seems like something that comes out of like, wow, where's that come from? But I got to tell you this, the only reason that, that he is able to give glory to God on the heels of such tragic loss is this, it's because of the strength that is only found in God and the truth that worship to God was second nature to Job. It's who Job was. So Job didn't like, oh, I need to put this on now. I need to, re mm, I really need to pull up really deep in my soul to really get, it was who Job was. Meaning, that's what he thought of God all along. Nothing changed. Now, is that a thing of beauty? Is that a thing of a lesson for us to be able to look at God that way? I really like what Martin Luther King said. He said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Worship of God is second nature. He can celebrate his faith in God naturally. It's not forced. Worship is his initial first response. It is spontaneous reaction to tragedy that just springs up naturally from his soul. And Job never could have responded this way unless he had been practicing that all along. He just couldn't. You don't go, oh, now's the time to read the book, go get counseling, make sure everything, now I can do this. It's who he was. Now, this should give us encouragement that we can actually walk this way. I think sometimes we look at the heroes of the Bible and we go, man, those rock stars, and you're just going, no, that's you and me. We are all in the same boat. Same God, same fallen people, like Job. Job just loved God. He just loved God so much that this was his natural reaction, his natural response. And I think this normalcy of his life where he, we saw it in the very beginning. He's blameless. He's righteous. He, he fears God. I mean, he talks about making sacrifices for his children because he loved his kids so much. Now, I do want to make a clarity here. And I don't know. All of worship doesn't have to be this joy-filled jumping up and down smile on your face. Fair to say. Job is stricken with grief and a sorrow that is so hard to imagine. I mean, you think about all y'all who are parents losing one child and how horrific that is and how horrific that would be. And then all of a sudden, all of them gone at once. I think it's probably one of the worst things to have to happen to a family is to have a child die while you're, especially while you're caring for them, while you love them, and while they're part of your family. But to have everybody gone? So this idea of joy-filled worship that has a smile and jumping up and down. His soul is in turmoil, and it's, it is crushed. And the question remains... Can real, true, authentic worship really happen when the heart is broken, the mind is in shock, and our emotions are shredded to bits? Can groaning and pain and sorrow be a part of worship? Job shows us that it can. Remember, imagine Mary at the foot of the cross. I mean, a mama. Dads don't get this, but mamas do. You're at the foot of, your co of, of the cross of Jesus. A son that you bore that is been told to you by an angel that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. This will be the Son of God. And now everything that you thought, well, you're know, going back to Simeon's prophecy of a sword will pierce your soul, Mary. You have no idea what's going to happen. But to be at the foot of the cross after that great, huge beating and the crown of thorns and the mocking and the spitting and the slapping and guess who hit you and then being nailed to a cross and now as a mama being at the foot of the cross going, what does that look like to be a worshiper at that moment? 
I believe groaning and pain and sorrow can be certainly a part of worship. Through pain, through grief, through great loss, I believe from Scripture, from the story of Job, can come a real sense of trust, of faith, of strength, and worship that looks differently than corporate worship on a Sunday morning. Mike Mason writes this, Real worship has less to do with offering sacrifices than being a sacrifice ourselves. Romans 12.1, we all know this verse, but in this context, listen, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, for this is your spiritual worship. I think writers like David in the Psalms and Paul in the New Testament letters and the book of Job change our religious vocabulary very hugely, turns it upside down with words like worship, faith, endurance, perseverance, hope, and love, from a cold, stale religion to something that has a great power to it, that I can actually surrender my life to God when everything here doesn't make sense. And that's why I believe this story of Job gives us hope that we can walk well, and even if you don't have to shave your head and tear your clothes. You can walk well, and you can definitely worship God no matter what the situation is. That is a thing of great promise for all of us. It is for me. You know, if we were honest and talking human terms, there's times that I don't feel like worshiping. I just don't feel like it. But this gives me strength and encouragement. He is to be worshiped all the time. And it's especially a beautiful thing when it is the only thing welling up in us because we don't have any other strength left. I must think that, that God thinks this is a thing of the most beautiful thing going, oh my gosh. This is what I told you, devil. This is exactly what I told you. Look at that guy. Look at it. He's been, you're doing all this stuff to him and look at him. You imagine that? That God goes, That's, this is what it looks like. That's what that looks like. All clean and nice and everything on us. This, this is the real deal. In your closet, in your bedroom when you're just flat out prostrate before the Lord, you're just, I can only trust in him. Because of this, I think it's true in Job's life, and I, I know, I know beyond a certain, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that that can absolutely be true in our lives. Job ain't nothing special, and neither are we. But God is, and so is the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. I'm going to end with this story that's going to set it up. For those of you that are watching on the video um, of the recorded service, we, I, are we going to have a link for that? We'll have a link on it. So we can't show it for the video purposes, but we're going to show it in here, so it'll probably cut off. But you're welcome to go to this story. 29 years ago.